Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall and boy do we have a project on the bench today. This is a Type A11 Elgin military watch from World War II. These were issued uh, by the US government. There was actually a, a military spec given out and then any company that could fill the orders did and there was actually quite a few. Uh, this one again is from the, the US, now defunct US company called Elgin and so I actually got, the, you can see the condition of this thing. I actually bought this watch as a donor movement for working on another one, on a donor watch, you know, a, a parts watch. And I got a really crazy idea in my head, I don't know why, that I would try to restore this. I didn't end up needing the parts that I thought I would for the other watch, and I thought, well, let's just, I don't know, let's just get crazy and dive in and see if we can't do a full restoration on this thing. And so that's what I'm going to do here. First thing, of course, you saw the front. It's in terrible shape, really the worst I've seen. But we got to see how the movement looks in the back because there is a chance here that if the movement is as rusted out as the dial, that there's really just no hope for this outside of just outright replacing basically everything. So let's take a look. Ooh, this isn't that bad at all, actually. In fact, this looks totally fine. So somehow some water got into this watch, but it apparently didn't make it to the back. And look, the balance wheel spins. Now, unfortunately, the, the crown won't pull out or turn. And that could be indication of rust there. But this is very promising. This... <laughs> Maybe the best case scenario or the worst, depending on how you look at it. Because now I'm thinking, okay, well, let's uh, let's continue with the project and see if I can't restore this thing. So first, I'm going to try to remove the crown. And you need to you know, undo that screw to take it out. But as you can see, it just will not budge. In fact, it won't move at all. I can't turn it or pull it out. So I'm going to get the heavy hitter out here and see if I can't break maybe some rust loose like this. And it's just not willing to give, but I have to take this out in order to get it out of the case. And I see if it can maybe, oh, did it let go? No, <laughs> it just broke off. <laughs> well, I knew that was a possibility when I grabbed the pliers. That's why you don't use pliers on stuff like this. But I have to get that crown out of there so that I can try to take the movement out of the case. So there's a little kind of a plastic type protective seal here. Again, I'm really happy to see that the movement looks so good. That's really great news. But the fact that I can't even remove the winding stem is, is not, not a good thing. Especially now that I've broken it off. So there's this uh, movement ring that holds the movement in place. It sort of lets it fit perfectly within the case, but it doesn't seem to want to budge either. Then there's a decent chance that it's rusted. I'm trying to give this a tap to see if I can get the movement to move and nothing's working. Maybe there's an edge of the stem still caught on the side and I can wedge it. I, it seems to be just rusted solid. And I'm not really sure how I'm gonna get this movement out of here. Well, I guess one thing I could try is to take the crystal off the front and then maybe I can push it from the dial side out. So let's do that. Let's take the crystal off. And see if this gives us maybe some leverage. Going to use my crystal lift here and just gently. <laughs> ah, all right. Maybe not so gently remove the crystal. So it has completely shattered. Obviously this crystal needed to be replaced 
in either scenario, but I did not expect it to completely shatter on me like this, but here we are. This project is off to a fantastic start. As you can see, this watch is so rusted underneath the dial that the re remnants of the hands, which is right there, are actually just floating around in little bits in the case, and then the dial has rusted into this weird blue color. So I guess let's just continue on. I, at this point, I'm, I'm wondering if I really want to continue with this, uh, but uh, I'm, uh, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, let's go. But unfortunately, it is just rusted solid. I'm applying a lot of pressure here, and I just can't get it to budge. Oh, there it goes. Now it came, okay, so it actually came out. I bent the dial a little bit doing it, and the dial looks absolutely horrendous, and now there's dust and debris all over my bench. Also, the case looks like it's in bad shape. This is a plated case. Nickel plated uh, brass is what it is, and uh, that seems to have disintegrated for the most part. So this is where the winding stem goes in. That's the part that broke off when I used the pliers, but it does look like it's sticking out enough that I can't take off the movement ring quite, so I need to kind of wedge and scrape at it until I can. There we go. Oh, look at my bench. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. I'm thinking, why did I do this again? But I know why I did it. I did it for you. You know, I always see the... Similar channels to mine will put up the thumbnail with a destroyed, you know, watch. And I always just wonder, like, where are you? <laughs> like, are you throwing dirt on? <laughs> like, where are you finding? Where do people just drop <laughs> nice watches in the mud and then just pick them up and bring them to people <laughs> with the mud still on them? <laughs> but uh, I guess it does happen as evidenced by this one. It didn't have any mud on it, but, I, you know, <laughs> completely destroyed. I found this one on eBay. I got a good deal. In fact, I got a great deal on it for obvious reasons. I'm trying to take off the dial screws here. They're also rusted. And this is requiring a lot more kind of brute force than I would normally want to give a watch, but I, I just don't really see how I have much of a choice there. That dial screw can come out. Now, one thing that could be working against us here is the, the hands, they've rusted off, but is there actually a chance that there's still the base of the hand on there? And it looks like after I clear away a little bit of debris that there is, so let's just take this off and see if it'll come up or just disintegrate. Oh, there we go. So you can see those rings. Those were the original base of the hand that actually attached to the watch right there. And they were rusted on as well. But thankfully, they, they came off. And that should facilitate us being able to take off the, the dial. As you can see, I'm just taking a quick look at what's underneath this rust. And it's, it's, it's just rusted. The paint is completely gone and it's rusted right to the metal. And once again, I'm trying really carefully to get these dial feet screws off because they're so small, but it actually did budge. It was rusted, but not completely gone. Oh, and that's a relief because if those get stuck in there, well, I, honestly, I don't know. I, I, you know, this is new territory for me. So let's see if we can't get this dial to release and actually pull away. And then we can see what's going on underneath it. Aha, victory. Victory is ours. Let's see what we've got here. Hey, that's not terrible. You can see some of the rust has reached the other side. And there's the former crystal. <laughs> I think we need to clean up the old bench here. Uh, this has gotten to be uh, a bit of a disaster. And while I do that, I did want to mention if you like what I do here on the channel, you can support me directly uh, via Patreon. You get a thank you card and a sticker in the mail. And I wanted to uh, to thank uh, Trevor, Robert, Mitchell, Mikey, James, George, Erica, Dustin, Brinton, Brett, Alex, and Brad for their support. Thank you. 
I really do appreciate it. It helps me uh, continue doing what I'm doing here and sharing this great hobby. And again, I'm really glad that you're here. I'm, I'm happy to have you along as we work our way through this perhaps too ambitious project. We'll find out. Uh, now we can start disassembling this watch though. So that's the cool part. And as I mentioned before, the movement itself phew, looks fine. Not really, not really seeing any major, uh, major stuff, right? I mean, this is a type of thing where we could have un undone it and seen just the whole entire thing, a, a big pile of rust, for example. And that doesn't seem to be the case here. Now we can remove this wheel that drives the second hand. There's definitely bits and pieces of stuff floating around, and so those are going to be an issue, but not necessarily a deal breaker. So we can start to take apart the keyless works. And you can see there's definitely some rust there as well, and this is going to be a place that we're going to have to focus. That's the hour wheel with the cannon pinion on it, and it is also rusted onto the uh, center wheel. I was hoping it would just pop free, but so far it doesn't seem to want to. So I'm going to use a pin vise here, and there we go. It actually worked. I just pulled off both of those, but they're unfortunately rusted together, so we're going to have to address that as well. Now we can flip the watch back over and continue disassembly. Start with the crown and ratchet wheel on this side. And this side again looks fine so far. It's interesting diving into this. Uh, it makes it more exciting because you don't know what's going to happen, but also I could easily outdo myself here and, and you know, find myself in a situation where there's uh, something that needs to be restored that I don't know how. So these are the things that we must navigate together. Yeah, you're in this with me now. There's no going back. I would love to be able to restore this though. This, uh, these A11 watches from World War II, so much history behind them. I mean, these were likely worn by people who were in World War II. Uh, you know, it's crazy. Okay. Going to take apart the the main bridge here. It actually covers both of the the ratchet wheel and the, the barrel, but it also covers a couple of the, uh, or at least one of the train wheels, maybe two, I can't remember. Yeah, two of them. And let's take a look at what we're working with under here. This is kind of our last big mystery, and yeah, it looks pretty clean. You can definitely see some rust, and yeah, the clutch wheel and the sliding clutch are rusted solid, and that stem is stuck in there too, so that is gonna be an issue. That was why we couldn't take the stem out. That was why we couldn't get it out of the case. And it's obvious where the water ingress happened, right? It, it happened at the, the crown. And it looks like a lot of it got in too. The lucky part is, is that the water seems to have accumulated and that was rusted as well, the center wheel. A lot of it seems to have accumulated at the, uh, on the dial side rather than the movement side where these, you know, these tiny wheels and stuff, and when they get rusted up, they're just gone. I mean, they, they literally just disintegrate. Okay, now we can take off the bridge that goes over the rest of the train wheels. But I don't anticipate finding any rust or anything under here. I think we've got a pretty clear view of what happened at this point. That there was a lot of water that came into the watch. It came in through the crown. It completely rusted the keyless works. And then it went to the dial where it just wreaked havoc there. Oop. There we go.
This thing's being a little finicky, but there we go. And there's the escape wheel coming out. That part in the middle there, that's, um, that's the hack. That's the hack mechanism. I'm gonna take that out here. Hacking is simple. It's when you pull out the crown to set the time, the, the watch stops. And the reason for that actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it in a military sense, which is that in order to make the watches useful, you have to have them synced up with other watches. And you would want to sync them up to the second if you could, right? Especially because, you know, these watches are fairly reliable and decent timekeepers, but you know, these are mass produced and they were, you know, before some of the technologies we have now for timekeeping. So you would really want to do that. And in fact, what I read is that, the, that they would do that every day, um, that they would get together with their, you know, sergeant or whoever was in the lead and they would sync up to that person's watch every day. But in order to do that, you have to be able to stop the entire watch. So these military spec A11s, they have a hacking movement. And that's that part that I had taken out there. All right, well, the rest of the keyless works comes out without too much drama. But again, the, the part that I'm a little concerned about is the part that's still stuck. Which is the sliding clutch and then what's left of the stem, which is still just rusted into place. We can also take apart the mainspring now and see what's going on in there. I would not assume that any water had gotten into the mainspring. And it hasn't. This does look like the original mainspring though. It's kind of an older style where they're just simply round, they, they're, they're concentric circles, where the newer ones are more like an S shape. It, it apparently is uh, more efficient to make them in the, in the newer style, but you'll see these quite often that they were designed like this. They're usually okay. I'll probably try to replace the mainspring though, just because this one's gonna be tired most likely. Okay, now we can start putting everything away and uh, getting it ready for watch cleaning machine and to do that. But we have a lot of inspecting that we need to do and we have a lot of de-rusting that we need to do. So this stuff is gonna get put into these baskets and then put in the watch cleaning machine for its first run through. And then we can inspect it later to see if it turned out okay. But we really have to address this rust issue and this is gonna be a big problem. The first place we need to start is right here the keyless works. They are rusted solid. And as you can see, it's a buildup of rust and it is not moving at all. There is no movement. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is take my tweezers and try to uh, scrape away the bulk of the visible rust because we're gonna end up putting this in a, in a chemical called evaporust, which is something that was, um, recommended to me by a bunch of, of watch people. And it works quite well. It's slow, but it's, it's non-toxic and uh, not as harsh of a chemical. And it doesn't eat away at the tiny watch parts. Some of the more harsh rust removers are actually strong enough to kind of destroy the watch parts. And this is the hour wheel with the cannon pinion inside of it. This is the one that I had to tear off the top with the uh, vice. And as you can see, it's rusted solid. The cannon pinion is actually just stuck inside of there. So let's put these in some evaporust and see if it can work its magic. I've had good luck with it, generally speaking. The one thing, and then that's a center wheel also. But the thing that, that, that it, you have to recognize is that it takes a long time. This is not a quick process. This is like an overnight or a two or three day type scenario. So those go in and now they've come out and let's take a look. Yes, they turn black in the evaporust and this center wheel looks like it's probably damaged enough, but check this out. Boom, that's the cannon pinion, it comes right out now. So how cool is that? All that rust is just completely gone and it was in fact gone enough that I could just simply pull that cannon pinion out with no effort whatsoever. So that worked very, very well. Again, it's, it turns it all kind of looks like it's almost charred. I don't know why it does that. It's some chemical reaction, I'm assuming. As you can see, there is still some visible rust here on the hour wheel, but just, I can sort of scrape at this with a piece of peg wood and I can put it back into some evapor rust and I'm sure that'll take care of it. Plus this looks mainly cosmetic at this point. Like this is, this doesn't look like it's like, you know, 
structurally deteriorating it. But here's the big question. Did it work here on the stem that was completely rusted into place? And as we can see, that's clear now. And yeah, okay, that looks a lot better too. But will the stem come out? Let's try it. Well, you can see that it moves a little bit, so that's happy. Oh, and there we go. It's out. Oh, that's a huge relief because this thing was well and truly rusted into place and getting it free was a major worry of mine and the evaporust really worked well. So thumbs up. And that means we can take the clutch wheel and the sliding clutch out. Now this does leave us with another problem though. This is the crown and this is the rest of the rusted stem that's still stuck in the crown. And similar situation here, that is rusted solid. And we need to reuse the crown to keep it as original as possible. Well, here's what it looked like after sitting in the evapor rust for a while. Again, the rust is gone, but then it kind of turns this black color. But if I can get that thing out of there, then we can reuse the original crown still and have that work. So let's see how this looks. We can use a, a little pin vise here and then see if we can't unscrew the crown gently, just a little bit. Yes, something's happening. Yes. And we did it. It actually let go. So hallelujah. <laughs> there you can see the rest of the, the stem. The stem has been released and now we can uh, reuse the original crown. Now we are going to have to find a replacement stem, of course. Now, the bridge doesn't look very nice. And so I read online that you could use vinegar and baking soda to detarnish. And it kind of is cool like this. So I've got an old toothbrush, not the one I use, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm going to try to detarnish the bridges and get them back to full condition. I want them to be looking nice, but also, you know, there was a lot of rust and debris and I want to make sure that uh, these things are good. So a lot of scrubbing and kind of awkward angles and stuff to try to get these things as detarnished as I can. Rinse them off in water and kind of repeat the process a bunch of times. And we'll see what we come away with here. I'm even gonna throw them in the one dip, which is a solvent, which hopefully will help dry it and, and remove any other little bits that are in there. Okay, well that's looking better already. The true test though, yeah, this looks pretty good. The true test though will be putting it on the microscope and seeing what's going on at the closer level. And so far, that looks nice. That's a perfect jewel. That's exactly what you wanna see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, these are actually looking very, very good. So here's a jewel that I took out of it for this cleaning and detarnishing process and it looked fine. That was, there's another one, yeah. And these ones have maybe could use a little bit more cleaning so I can get in there with the Rotico a little bit to kind of just get any debris, but the fundamentals are there. And there you go, even, you know, get picking up any of the little dust on there. This one has a little tiny bit of, uh, I don't know, something stuck in there. So I'm just gonna use a little smoothing brooch to just kind of clean it out real quick. And then afterwards, that's what it looks like, fantastic. And by the way, <laughs> just a quick reminder of the scale that we're working with. Those are the screws. <laughs> it's funny because I do all this close-up work and I got the microscope and my macro lens and all that. But I do like to remind you every once in a while that uh, these are very small. And th this movement's quite small too. Uh, by Even by modern standards, it's small. Okay. Well, it looks like we can take a trial run here at getting this watch uh, back together and starting the reassembly process because, yeah, I 
feel like it looks fine. And I think it, I did it about the most thorough cleaning job you can do on this thing. I mean, this thing went through ultrasonic, the watch cleaning machine, detarnishing, re-ultrasonic. I mean, it, it, it really kind of went through the, the motions. So I can get the initial train wheels in, or I should say the last of the train wheels in, and then I can push the click back into place. Uh, sorry, not the click, the hack. That's the hack that I talked about before. Found a new mainspring for this watch, so we're gonna be installing that rather than the old one. Hopefully that'll help keep the performance up. When you get a new mainspring, it comes in this little metal disc that holds it in place and then you have to press it into the barrel. Whichever side of the disc has paint on it, that goes up. The bottom will have, it will just be unpainted. There are different colors. They're blue and red and gray and all these other colors. Okay, and now we can put the barrel arbor in and then <clears throat> get the, uh, the cap in place. And now we can put the barrel into the watch, make sure it looks good. Yeah, okay, fits, fine, sure. And then we can continue with the reassembly. Now, some of these parts, most of them I'm reusing. I, you know, they, they seemed okay and I, after inspection and stuff, but there are a few that I'm taking uh, from a, another A11 Elgin that I have that's not functional. Um, and those are the parts basically that were too rusted away or had taken too much damage from the rust to be able to be used. But surprisingly, it wasn't that many parts. I, you know, when I took this project on, I had the other watch because I knew that I was going to have to replace some stuff and we're going to have to make some decisions about what to replace and what not later as well. But uh, as far as the mechanics of the watch go, you know, most of the parts I'm able to keep original and reuse. And when, when I restore a watch, that is my goal. I, I would prefer to keep as many parts or as original as possible, with a few exceptions. Um, parts that are meant to be replaced regularly, I, I'm not quite as squeamish about, you know, the mainspring. I, I don't put a particular value on having the original mainspring in the watch. I will always keep it. And if I work on something for somebody else, they can have it. But, uh, you know, you can't see that part ever, even if you open up the back of the watch and uh, it really does aid in the performance. But for the most part, I like to try to keep the stuff as original as I can. Okay, so let's get the keyless works back together. As you can see, I am reusing those parts as well. They're all black from the evaporust. I should probably figure out if there's a, a way I can... Um, solve that. If I wonder if I can put them in the evaporous, get the rust off, and then also do something else to them to kind of bring back their shine. All right, Keyless Works finishing up here. There's an the intermediate wheel. That's just a kind of in-between wheel that goes out to the Motion Works, which is the, the wheels that actually turn the hands of the watch. I inspected this too, and I'm going to reuse it. It's got a rust stain on it, but it's not uh, compromised functionally. This is a setting lever spring, but it's also a cover plate, and it kind of acts as a holder for a bunch of different little things. Okay, so now we can put the second hand pinion here in the middle. And this part goes on the top. And this is the wheel that attaches to one of the train wheels and then transfers that power over to the middle so that you get that center seconds rather than offset. Now I'm putting the pallet fork back in. So we'll get that thing in place and I can put a wind in the watch. And this is kind of the big moment because it looks like the pallet fork's getting power, meaning that the Power's going through, and now it's time to see if this watch will actually run. And it, it hasn't since I've had it, so I don't know if it's going to want to run or not. And I kind of wouldn't be surprised either way, to be honest. Oh, it looks like it wants to go. Maybe 
Maybe I can just get the balance bridge in place a little bit to help it. No? Put a little more wind in it? Maybe that's what's going on? No? Hmm. Doesn't seem to want to run, but so further inspection of the balance revealed a very, very crooked impulse jewel. And maybe this is why. Now, I have never actually had to deal with this before, but I looked it up online and I made a little setup for myself here. So I actually took one of my old baskets and I filed it down flat because I didn't have a piece of brass. I also don't have a spirit lamp, so I'm using a lighter. And what you do is you heat up that piece of brass and then you set the part on it to transfer the heat to shellac, <laughs> which is inside of it which you can, by the way, see a piece of shellac sitting there. It's just that brown stick. And then when the heat gets hot enough, then you can push it through. And this was my result. So this is a re -shellac. Now it's not perfect, but it's much, much better than it was before. So let's see how it does. If I can get this dang thing running. Okay. Oh, and there we go. It's running again. Okay, so this is great news. We've got the watch running. There is a question, of course, is how well is it running? Because before, it really wouldn't run at all. And uh, let's put it on the time grapher and see how it does. And that's not terrible. I, it's not amazing, but it's not the worst, actually. Plus seven seconds a day, 251 degrees of amplitude is fine. The beat airs pretty off 4.3 is is a lot um, but I can tweak that later and I think I'm going to be happy with the fact that we have a now running watch now one of the things I also noticed though was that the hack isn't working that bar is supposed to actually touch up against the balance wheel there and stop it from spinning so that you can set the watch without it running but it looks like the hack doesn't quite reach the balance wheel so we're going to do some tweaking here to see if we can get a functional hack for this movement. And as you can see, I didn't quite move it enough. It's close, but it's not quite there. So we're gonna need to, to work on this a little bit more. I also am trying to be very careful because it would be quite easy for that to break, I think. It's, it's old. A Little bit of a tweak and let's see if we can't get it to actually touch this time and stop the balance. There we go, got it. Okay, so that's done. The hack is working. Now let's take a look at the rest of the watch. We have a, a functional movement, let's say, and now we need to look at what else is going on with the watch as far as this restoration goes, because we are far from done here. So I'm gonna take a look at this dial first, and I think the first order of business is just to see what is actually going on with this dial, because it has so much rust and debris on the front that you can't really tell exactly what it would look like under there, and you can't put the dial back on in this state because that debris will fall off of the of the dial and it'll work its way into the movement and stop the watch from going. So I'm just gonna use a cotton swab and some sticks here to kind of get any of the chunks off that could fall off. And then we'll also get a chance to see what this dial actually looks like underneath. And as you can see, it's pretty bad. Um, there's kind of a cool factor to a beat up dial. This is probably a little bit too far down that road as it's really trash, like you can barely read it. So we're gonna have to make that decision down the line. For now, we'll set that aside and let's take a look at this case. Now this case is in very bad shape. As you can see, just using a piece of pegwood to clean it up results in uh, the plating and stuff just flaking off of it and falling onto uh, the pad there. So I don't like this. I think that this makes the watch look really beat up and crappy when the plating starts to come off of a plated watch. <sighs> So I think I'm gonna to try to fix it. Now this is gonna involve diving into something that I've wanted to get into for a while but have never actually done and that's electroplating. Yes, we are gonna fully restore this watch today including the case. And by the way, while looking at it, I found some interesting markings on the inside of the case. It says, I think it's Roman numeral 6789. I, I don't know what that might stand for. I tried to look it up and I couldn't find anything, but somebody scratched that into the inside of the case, which I thought was interesting. So in order to do electroplating, 
what you need to do is you need to reduce it to the bare metal, the, the base metal that's underneath whatever was plated onto it by sanding it off. Then you have to get that base metal to exactly how you want it to look with the plating on it, and then you plate it. And so plating ends up being heavily preparation-based, and it is hard. <laughs> so I have to actually scrape off all of the nickel plating on this with these sanding sticks until I can get to just plain brass. And then I have to get the brass into good enough shape as far as polish and smoothness and stuff goes that it'll take the plating and actually look okay doing it. Because any issue that you have on the, the base metal will show up through the plating even more. So as you can see, the plating starting to come off and we can see the brass underneath. I've obviously sped up this part of the video because it took a really long time to actually work my way through the, the plating level and to get to the brass. But I did want to show you the process and so that's why I left it all in. I just sped it up because there's so much of it to do here. And as you can see, now I'm starting to do the more angled surfaces again with these sticks and, I, and I'm not gonna make you sit through each of those because they're all the same. But this is roughly what I came up with after having done the first initial long pass of sanding to get it down to the brass. And you can see there's still a little bit of nickel on there that I'll have to address, but the brass is here. And this is, uh, sort of the crude stage of where we need to get before we actually do proper nickel plating on this thing. And again, if we plated it just like this, all those little swirl marks and stuff would show up. So what that means is we need to do some polishing beforehand before we can actually do the plating. And so I've got my Dremel set up here to do some polishing. I don't have a, a big polishing wheel and I, I'll get one at some point because it makes the work a bit faster, but I kind of appreciate that the Dremel gives such a small surface area because it lets you get into every little tiny nook and cranny, especially on a small case like this. Now we need to put it into the ultrasonic cleaner and that'll get off any of the uh, dust or polishing compound that might've been left over on it. Looks better already. And now we can go for it. So the plating process goes like this. First, we put it in this solution, which is a, an acidic cleaner. Then we have to get our power source ready. <laughs> and this is really important because we have to set this to the proper voltage or er, current. If you use too much, uh, it will not plate correctly. Too much plating tries to get on at once and it builds up. And if you don't use enough, it gets patchy and has black marks on it. So, this is very, very finicky stuff that took me, a, there, let's just say there's a lot of coins that I polished and put through this process to get to the point that I could do this. So after it's been sitting in the acid for a while, you take it out and you have to rinse it in distilled water to make sure that there's none of that left on before it actually goes into the plating solution, which is a basically just a, a liquid that has um, nickel dissolved in it. And as you can see, it sits in here. Then you hook up the, electri the electrical part. The negative goes through the actual part itself and then the positives go through a nickel, a plate of nickel. And then once you turn it on, it goes. Now, you're not gonna be able to see too much here. If you, if you plate bigger things, you can actually see kind of a bit of bubbling and fizzing and stuff that happens. But in order to get the lowest, a, a low enough voltage for a part this small, you won't actually see much of that if you're doing it properly. Um, I did see that at first uh, on some of my test runs and it uh, was bad. It, it ruined it basically. So it has now been plated. We did it for about half an hour and we can take it out and rinse it once again. You can see already it's changed color, so that's good. And let's see what we've got. Hey, this isn't too bad. Now you can see that it's not completely even. There's a little bit of marks and stuff, but you know what? We can still polish this. I've put a thick enough plate on it that it can actually take a little bit of a polish to get it looking good. And uh, we can try to get this thing nice because it's got a good even coverage on it and it looks like it's come back to life already quite a bit. I'm actually quite thrilled with this because, well, this was a lot of prep work and then, okay, here we go. 
And uh, so yeah, so let's get some of my finer polishing sticks out here. These are the ones that we would use kind of at the end of the process and see if we can't get this case looking really nice. Oh yeah, that's polishing up beautifully. This is really exciting for me because if I can get good at this process, then there, it opens up the door for a whole lot more restoration work that I can do for plated watches because there's still quite a few plated watches you know, from the era that I like to concentrate in in the 60s and stuff. So again, a full polish with the sticks and we end up with... <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I am thrilled with this outcome. I mean, this is a 75 year old watch that, and my first plating job ever, and it looks sweet. Is it perfect? No, <laughs> I can definitely find ways to improve, but I am really happy with how this came out and for the purposes that I'm doing this, thumbs up. And all of those pennies that I polished actually paid off because getting the prep work down was really the, the key. It really was. I kind of thought plating might like fill in the crevices and sort of cover up your work, but it turns out it's the opposite. Okay, so with that done, we can begin our final preparation, or I should say final assembly here. And the first thing to do is to replace that crystal that I kind of broke at the beginning of the video. So I've got a brand new one here to put into our freshly plated case. I'm very proud of this, if you can't tell. Okay, so new crystal goes on the rover press. The case is dangling at the bottom there. It actually uses one of the smaller attachments that I've used, again, just because the cases on these older watches are much, much smaller than modern designs. There we go, get it fit into the bezel area, and then just gently undo, and that'll let the, um, uh, the new crystal uh, expand into the slot, and this looks nice. Okay, so with that job done, we've got the case and the crystal looking good and ready to go. We have a decision to make here, uh, because check this out, this looks great, right? but we need to make sure that everything looks great on this watch. And that means we have to address this dial situation. So we've got this dial, which is the obviously the, the one that I cleaned up and it is in really poor shape, but kind of cool, right? Kind of a neat thing to have like the original dial all beat up. And then this is the dial from the donor watch, which is actually why I bought it in the first place because the dial was in darn good shape for what it is. So we have to make a decision on which of these dials to use. Now, these are swappable, so you know I could change them out. But I think for me, I'm gonna go with the better looking dial. Um, if the other one had a little bit of wear, that would be pretty cool, I think. But this one is really trash. Like, it is actually just hard to read the watch. And to me, once it starts to get into that functionality range, I'm a little less excited about it. So. Yeah, I'm gonna use the good looking dial here as a starter and hey, you let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, you know, would you use the the trash dial and kind of have it be, you know, kind of a cool look for, you know, having the original dial and all that or would you use the, the better looking one here? The good news is I can swap them out if I want. So I could always try out the, the other look. Okay, gotta get the movement ring on here. And then we can go about uh, getting the hands on and then we can case this, this watch up and then our long journey from totally destroyed to uh, restored will we'll be finished. Okay, our hand goes on first. Then the minute hand. And as we hit kind of the home stretch for this restoration, I did want to mention, I do have uh, Instagram um, for wristwatch revival. So if you want kind of in between project updates and that kind of thing, you can check that out. It's wristwatch underscore revival over there. You can also say hi. 
Okay, seconds hand goes on last. And let's see how things are looking. Make sure that the hands are not touching each other or knocking each other off of their posts or anything like that. And that looks about right to me. So now we can prep the case and the, the movement for final assembly. What a journey this one has been. I mean, I learned how to electroplate. <laughs> it's just like crazy. All right, in goes the crown. And we'll get that secured. And then there's this little cover plate that goes on the inside of the uh, movement. As well as the actual case back. I really love to use these the rubber ball, just find it to be the most handy tool for this. I have, you know, a case opening thing and a, I have a few others, but the rubber ball is the one I end up using the most just because it's the most convenient. And there we go. Look at what we have done. We have fully restored this thing from a totally trashed throwaway watch I got off eBay for cheap into something historical and fantastic and i hope that somebody will be proud to wear or display as uh you know again these watches have some real history behind them they're special watches and uh i just feel lucky that i get to be one of the people that restores them sometimes we'll put a nato strap on this thing because i assume that's how these were worn when they were used uh, for military use I don't know, actually, but I assume something like this would have been used. It certainly would be now. And that thing just came out flat out gorgeous. I have to say, I do like this dial a lot on the watch. I, I think it, I think it's probably the right choice. It also matches the hands, which were from the same watch as well. As we know, the other hands were completely disintegrated. And there you go. That is an Elgin A11 full restoration for you and uh, super excited about this one. Um, didn't think it would come out this good when I got into it. I'm not going to lie, um, but I'm super proud of the work I did and I'm really happy that you were able to come along with me. Um, as I mentioned before, you can find me on Instagram, wristwatch underscore revival. And uh, if you'd like to support what I'm doing here on the channel, if, if you like the videos and stuff and you want to see them coming, you can head over to patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. And uh, you can sign up and support me uh, for to keep on making videos. I really appreciate everybody who helps me out over there. And I look forward to making more of these. And once again, I wanted to say thank you for joining me. I love having you along for this hobby. And we'll see you on the next one.